Good morning. Uh, the title of our talk is Internet Legislation is Eating the World. So there is a cotton warning. We are going to be covering sex, sex trafficking, and politics. As it was said before, this is, can be distressing for a lot of people, so if you want to leave, we won't be offended. Good day, RubyConf. I'm Eliza, also known as Xemophobia. And I'm Jack, but again, most of you know me as Chendo. Some people think it's my real name. <laughs> but it's not, and I have the ID to prove it, so if you want to see it, <laughs> come see me afterwards. We've previously worked at a bunch of companies that you might have heard of. So it's early, and I know that everyone's still getting caffeinated, but I'm going to start with a question. What do these news article titles have in common? Reddit bans subreddits dedicated to dark web markets and selling guns. Scruff gating out bans underwear photos. The new law that killed Craigslist personals could end the, in could end the web as we know it. And Cloudflare just banned a social media refuge for thousands of sex workers. So to fully understand this, we need to go back in time just a little bit. In 2017, we started Assembly 4 with the idea to create products solely for the sex industry. Early last year, we heard through our network that sex workers' accounts on social media, web services, were having their accounts shadow banned, content removed, or outright deleted due to a bill that might be signed into law. We decided to take this into our own hands, and we launched a social network for sex workers so they could continue to communicate with their peers. So you may have heard of this thing called Mastodon, which is an open source microblogging platform, aka Twitter, built in this uh, little underground forum that you've probably never ever heard of called Ruby on Rails. It made the rounds a few months ago when Twitter was being slightly more of a trash fire than usual. <laughs> so we picked a name, bought the domain, deployed an instance, and then two days later... Our other co-founder, Lola, launched it with this tweet. Twitter is what the sex worker community called it, their community on Twitter, so we used that name and just ran with it. But it went a tad viral. So we had to put it on a $15 <laughs> a month VPS because maybe we're expecting 500 to 1,000 users, but uh, yeah. So I had, to take the, um, I had to take it down in the first two hours to double the capacity. But it was kind of a, you know, a uh, collar pulling moment when I had to take it down two hours later to quadruple again. So we went from a two gig, two gig VPS to a 16 gig VPS in four hours. And this next slide kind of embodies our feelings <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> so um, I think my favorite one is the two kids paddling canoe that is clearly underwater. <laughs> Very accurate representation of Chendo yeah. and I. <laughs> and uh, in the morning was the community GIF, where we'd open up and then just see just kind of chaos. Yeah. So within the first 24 hours, we had hit 5,000 users. And that weekend, we had to scale up to a 10-node cluster, <laughs> which was very cobbled together, really. <laughs> but then something completely left field and unexpected happened. Backpage was seized by the FBI. All you need to know, Backpage was a classifies advertising platform that was massively popular with sex workers, and it was a critical resource. They didn't have many other options when it was taken down. In an instant, their ability to support themselves was gone. We received an influx of panicked messages from people who saying we had to do something, anything. So they came to Twitter. We decided on a specific hashtag for people to use to post their listings, so that way people, clients could search it. We hacked together a page in three hours, and it does a lot of traffic. <laughs> Our traffic doubled overnight, and within the first few days, we were overwhelmed with the response of people thanking us for getting something together as quickly as we did. And we kind of thought it would be smooth sailing from there. <laughs> but something completely inconceivable happened. On April 18th, we awoke to this baby. 
we were kicked off Cloudflare for breaking their terms of service. The last notable publication of Cloudflare terminating an account belonged to a neo-Nazi website. And of course, we put in that pool room. <laughs> Where else does it go? <laughs> Great movie, if you've never seen it, you should watch it. <laughs> you might be asking yourselves, why? Well, it's probably due to this little law you might not have heard of. The Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act. Or as it's more commonly known, the Foster Sesta Package. Foster Sesta was signed into the law by United States President Trump of last year in April. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and this is no exception. The intent behind Foster Sesta was to give law enforcement agencies extra powers to help combat and prosecute sex trafficking. Those powers included harsher criminal sentencing, removing safe harbor protections from platforms that knowingly assist, support, or facilitate sex trafficking. It also allows for sex trafficking victims to file civil lawsuits. At the moment, you're probably looking at us going, this sounds like a really good thing. And I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> Foster Sesta is extremely vague, and platforms that deal with any kind of user content will be erring on the side of caution and over-censor the risk, uh, over-censor their user at the risk of being held criminally liable. Female presenting nipples, anyone. One of the problems with Foster Sesta is it makes no distinction between consensual sex workers and sex trafficking victims. As I mentioned before, it weakens Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor is the piece of legislation that protects platforms from being held liable for the content that they use as post. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Criminalization hurts sex workers and sex trafficking victims. Statistics show that in countries where sex work is illegal, that there is increased violence. This makes it impossible for sex workers or sex tra trafficking victims to come forward to the authorities for fear of being arrested or instead of protected. Erosion of trust in support systems. Sex workers often face stigma because of their job and this results in lower quality of service or even refusal of services. Think about that. Being refused financial services, legal representation, and even healthcare because of your occupation. Sex workers often experience increased vulnerability due to all the reasons I just listed and more. <clears throat> the list of organizations that support decriminalization of sex works are Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the World Health Organization, and other global organizations are supportive of this as a proven way to decrease sex trafficking and violence against sex workers. Online platforms are important to the safety of sex workers. It allows them to screen potential clients from the safety of their homes, rather than on the street where they have to make a quick snap judgment whether or not someone is safe. It enables sharing of safety information and resources, and most importantly, it allows them to work independently of pimps, brothels, and agencies. Backpage was just one of the many sites that they relied on. And now they're gone. So during my research, I found a, the most sobering statistic came from this research paper by economics professor Scott Cunningham, where they found that the Craigslist erotic services section reduced the female homicide rate by 17.4%. So, to be clear, that's not the homicide rate for sex workers. That's the overall female homicide rate. The paper also estimated it would cost 20 billion in police funding to achieve the same effect. Here are some of the organizations that oppose Foster SESTA, including, again, the World Health Organization, the ACLU, the EFF, Wikimedia, Amnesty International, and the crazy part, even the US's own Department of Justice opposed it. The Assistant Attorney General wrote a letter said it raises some serious constitutional concerns, as well as some of the language being used being overly broad and unnecessary. 
And if that wasn't enough, the AFF argued that FOSTA SESTA wasn't required and that websites that break, knowingly break this legislation were already liable. This is due to the Fair Housing Council of San Fernando Valley versus roommates, which ruled that safe harbor immunity doesn't apply if online services were directly involved with the creation of content that violates civil law. Sex worker rights are human rights. People should have the right to support themselves in a safe manner, but more importantly, people should have autonomy over their own bodies. Now, some of you may be wondering, how does any of this affect you, me? Whatever. <laughs> so, it's, it's some work, but please raise your hands if you recognize any of these books. <coughs> Paolo spoke at RubyConf last year, right? So, pragmatic programmers have forums, and they shut them down because of Foster Sesta. And they say in the second paragraph, we cannot possibly monitor all posts made in real time and decide whether or not they break any particular interpretation of a vague and imprecise law. This is logistically ludicrous and philosophically objectionable. And so the forums no longer exist. So remember when we told you that we got kicked off Cloudflare? They never actually responded to any of our repeated requests to actually find out what we broke in their terms of service. But, lucky for us, they did talk to the media about it. <laughs> Terminating service to Twitter is related to our attempts to understand Foster Sesta, which is a very bad law and sets a very dangerous precedent. This was said by the Cloudflare legal counsel, Doug Kramer. If a company as big as Cloudflare doesn't understand this legislation, how does any startup have a chance? Foster Sesta stifles innovation by making it harder for smaller companies to deal with content. We've been here before. Does anyone remember? Oh, sorry, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an Australian or you're from one of the Five Eyes countries, you would probably have heard of the Australian metadata retention laws. So recently, they released a list of all the agencies that has requested access to the data. So the text is kind of small, but I'm going to point out some of the ones I find a bit questionable. Can someone please tell me why Greyhound Racing Victoria, <laughs> the Taxi Services Commission of Victoria, or even the Healthcare Complaints Commission would want with our metadata? So we just actually spoke about the Assistance and Access Bill. In December of 2018, the Australian government rammed through the Assistance and Access Bill without due process. The Assistance and Access Bill is primarily known for the powers in Schedule 1. There are two compulsory and one voluntary. The technical assistance request, there are no criminal or civil penalties for not complying, but this is a power they already had. The technical assistance notice, which is the compulsory notice for a provider to use interception capability that the company already has. So if you're storing messages in plain text, you can already hand those over. And the last and the scariest is the technical capability notice, which is compulsory. This is the power that states you have to build a new interception capability in order to comply with the technical assistance notice. We know for a fact these powers are in use, and every day we move closer to becoming a surveillance state. So there's this proposed European Copyright Directive which is ominously called Article 13, aka the end of memes. <laughs> so it's a proposed law that would force all for-profit companies that serve the EU to upload, uh, to install upload filters, where all user content will be uploaded to a, to a centralized system that's meant to detect copyright infringement. Now, if only there was something like this that already exists, so we know how this goes down. Oh wait, the YouTube digital rights management that they have called Content ID, where it's meant to allow copyright holders to monetize content that other people upload, but instead is being abused by DRM trolls so they can steal revenue from content creators because Content ID cannot tell the difference between infringement or fair use. 
This is not the only way that these automated systems are hurting content creators. So many of us from the internet, you might have seen this person. Philip DeFranco, he's an American YouTuber who has been active for over 13 years. He has over six million subscribers and he hosts a new show called The Philip DeFranco Show. Philip DeFranco has his videos regularly suppressed and demonetized because he covers subjects that aren't considered advertiser friendly, such as political conflicts, war, natural disasters, or as we like to call it, news. <laughs> it's gotten to the point that DeFranco's company, Rogue Rocket, diversified their income by joining Patreon so they could continue creating news content without worrying about YouTube's algorithms. <sighs> Legislation is all well and good, but no amount of legislation will stop companies from doing shit like this. So, you may have saw this title recently. I mean, it says three days ago, but we, we made this a few days before that. <laughs> but Facebook were paying teenagers like 30 something bucks a month? That was like 20. Yeah. But... Like a lot, maybe for teenagers, but it would install a VPN onto their devices that would funnel all traffic, including the encrypted traffic, through their servers so they can figure out what they're looking at. And then Google was also found doing this a few days later, and Apple went and revoked their enterprise certificates, which uh, caused some mayhem inside their offices for the developers. But had that been someone else, do you think they would have had a harsher penalty? <coughs> so I love Jurassic Park. You were so preoccupied with whether or not you could, you didn't just stop to think if you should. We all want to ship, but maybe we need to step back and actually think about what we are shipping. How could this impact our users? Could this be used to hurt my user? Could I be arrested for this feature? How bad could it be? <sighs> when we started Assembly 4, we never thought we would be here today. We didn't expect the sheer complexity of building a company in a heavily stigmatized industry. The battles we would face just to keep the lights on, as well as just to treat our users with the respect that they deserve. We want to keep Switter running without resorting to the industry standard of selling user data. We launched Trist.link, a modern advertising platform for escorts, to make sure that Switter stays free and accessible for the entire community. This is the photo that we took when Twitter hit 100,000 users. This was June last year. As of this morning, Twitter has over 220,000 users. It does 15 million requests a day and pushes over 18 terabytes a month. We all have a social responsibility to make sure the world doesn't go to shit. Just because it's law doesn't mean it's right. There are going to be more laws like this, and we need to fight them. Damn the man. We need to fight for our users. Last Saturday morning, the creator of Rails said, maybe it's time we need an algorithmic oath for, for programmers. I will program no harm, by privacy theft, attention hoarding, or radicalization optimization. I would not put engagement metrics above the humans they are extracted from. Our industry needs to be better, not just for our users, but for us. This is our legacy. We want to believe. Thank you.